What is a writable book API? Uh, well, I, I would say at the moment it doesn't, it doesn't really exist yet, but it's an idea that could exist, uh, which is you, you, want to, you want to provide access to books uh, programmatically for people who are writing applications and so on. So an API, of course, is for applications to uh, get access to data. But because books are such social objects and there's so much going on around books, um, if you make a writable API, then you, you're allowing for the possibility that um, people can contribute data. And the, the book is not a static object, which is just sort of received by the reader. And people can interact with it in different ways. And they can store information. So for example, if I'm reading a book, and I notice that you're reading it, I might want to say, hey, I'm reading this book as well. And I'm up to page 200, and read someone else's opinion, and, and so on and so forth. And if you have an API that's writable, it allows you to store that information with the book, mm. in a sense, rather than putting that information somewhere else. And I think, I think books can make a transition to the point where they sort of become writable objects, in, in some sense. And an API just provides access to that information. I see. OK. So uh, a book as a writable object, how does that end up benefiting publishers? I think it, it's, uh, it's very good for publishers because it's, uh, it allows their readers to interact with the objects. And, uh, if readers, if there are applications, for example, that can say allow readers to say, hey, I've read this book, or I'm reading it, or I liked it, and so on, and the publisher has access to that information programmatically, then you can change the experience for the reader when they come to the publisher's website, for example. I see. So uh, to take a good example uh, that's, that's very relevant to O'Reilly, when I go to the O'Reilly website and I look at a book, it makes recommendations for several other books, but I own those mm. other books mm -hmm. uh, in many cases. And I would rather see recommendations for books that I don't own. But there's no way for me to contribute that information to, you know, to say, I own this book, and for O'Reilly to get at it programmatically when I come to your website and, and react on it. Um, and so the publisher can benefit from, uh, from the same thing, because the readers are putting their information onto the same objects. Mm -hmm. The publisher can go and dig around inside that information and say, hey, you know what? Your friends are reading this stuff, and make the make the purchasing experience, in some sense, uh, more valuable. Uh, the publisher can also do things like um, add extra data to the book, like add, add extra metadata, for mm -hmm. example, like the, uh, the marginalia or the notes that were, that were taken on the book by the author when they were creating the book. And that can be another tag, if you like, which is on the book object, which could be sold to okay. the reader. You could say, right. you know, here's the, here's the book, and it's free if you want it. Sure. And you can pay $2 if you want to see the author's notes, um, or an interview with the author, which is also attached to the same book object. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities for publishers to, to sort of make the experience for readers richer, mm -hmm. and to benefit as a result. Um, and I, I guess your next question will probably be, you know, what's the, what's the benefit Share for the, the reader? Side. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's all, those two things are all bound together. And I think if you, you know, if you're making the book more of a living object, where it's not just the company that's manufacturing this object and selling it to the consumer, who then reads it and consumes it and throws it away, um, there's more of a feedback loop there. Mm -hmm. you know, the, just the fact that I'm reading a book is adding information to that book in, a, in some broad sense. Right. But there's currently no place for that information to be captured. I, I, I could write it on my hand, or mm -hmm. I could send myself an email, I could send a friend an email, I could write a blog post saying, hey, I'm reading. Uh, you know, programming Python, but that information belongs with the book. Because if you put it with the book, then when you're reading that book and I'm reading that book, we can do searches that wouldn't otherwise be possible. We can say, hey, you know what? We're both reading that book. What else have you read that I haven't read? And the O'Reilly website can react and can say, you know what? Your friend Mac read that book, mm -hmm. and he's got this thing on his wish list. Uh, and by the way, maybe it's his birthday next week. Sure, you sure, can buy him a right. book. <laughs> um, and another, another way of looking at this stuff is, that, is about personalization. And the world is becoming more writable and more personalizable and so on. People's experiences are changing. Uh, they're becoming more social in some sense. And personalization is, right now, it's sort of done on our behalf. Mm -hmm. It's not in our hands. And even if you go to a site like Amazon, they try to customize and personalize your experience. But it's not really personal. It's what they think. It's like people like you, according to Amazon. I want to know what you read. You know, or what did Tim read or, or so mm -hmm. on? Um, that's personalization sort of in our hands. And if you, have a, if you have a really writable architecture with an API, then normal people can take things into their own hands. They can write an extension, let's say, or use an extension where you can click on a book and say, you know, you know what, I own that book. Or I'd mm -hmm. like that to be on my wish list. And here's the page number that I'm up to, or whatever. And you know, 
that's personalization which is in our hands. And the world becomes richer for everybody in some sense. Right. So last question I have for you. You mentioned the book is a living object. Does that mean that publishers need to reject the entire idea that a book ends? I think that would be healthy, yes. Um, in fact, in fact, I, I sort of think of publishing as a very, as a very, uh, in a very general sense. Um, like we're publishing information all the time. I chose to wear this T-shirt today mm -hmm. because I went to an event yesterday, and I like the T-shirt. But I also want to tell people here that I'm I'm at this conference and I was at the event yesterday. Maybe people will say hi to me and so on. I'm pu I'm publishing stuff all the time, and books are a special case. And I think that the publication of a book really starts with an author saying to someone else, hey, you know what, I had an idea for a book. The book has already begun sure. at that point. Mm -hmm. It may never actually eventuate, but it, it already exists. And I could say, well, I'm, I'm thinking about writing a book about you know, Barcelona, for example. And the publisher tells someone else, hey, Terry's thinking of writing a book about Barcelona. And someone else says, there's a new book about Barcelona being written by this guy you know, who lives in Barcelona, let's mm -hmm. say. And maybe before the book is written, Amazon makes it possible to pre-order the book. So it still doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It's not physically there, but there's a ball of information which is accumulating around what eventually will or maybe may, may not become a book. And that's, a, that's an ongoing process. At some point in time, there's, a, there's an actual physical publication, one or more. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you know, people are reading and saying, hey, I read that book. Did you hear about that book? There's no copies left at Borders, but you can get it down at, uh, well, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> There's no copies. <laughs> you can get it down at you know Barnes and Nobles and so sure. on. Um, hey, chapter five is fantastic. Uh, you know the cover art is kind of crappy. The paper printing is bad. Um, all of that information, which is a ball of information about that thing, which is a book, that's all publishing. But we don't have anywhere to capture that information. Mm. And if we did, if the book was a writable object that w that uh, where we could continually put information onto it and search on it and sort it and filter it and so on, then. You can, you can adopt the point of view that publishing you know, starts at the instant of conception and doesn't really end. Mm -hmm. um, even if the book goes out of existence, there's no more copies, they're all lost. All the metadata is still valid. It's like there was a book called such and such and we can't find a copy of it anymore. It's like an extinct animal. Mm -hmm. you know, it's still around, it's still the, the memory of it is still there and all that stuff which we traditionally would say, that's just metadata and the central thing is actually the content of the book and you know, the metadata can't exist in a digital sense until the content is there, that model is, is sort of broken because mm. the real world doesn't work that way. And I think you can build a digital world that looks like that. And in that digital world, publication never ends. It right. doesn't stop. And this old fashioned idea of, right, we published it, let's do something else. Uh, you readers go and consume it. Uh, that's probably going to go away, mm -hmm. I think. I hope, anyway. <laughs> that's what we're trying to do. Well, thank you very much for being with us. Appreciate uh, it. Yeah, you're welcome.